Businesses thrive by knowing customer insights because today's insights are tomorrow's facts. At iResearch, we live and breathe insights. And despite searching high and low, we were unable to find a customer insights podcast that answers one of the most important questions in business. Why do customers do what they do? So we launched one. Hi, I'm your host, Darshan Mehta. I'd like to introduce Gitish Dubal. He is a seasoned healthcare executive with nearly two decades of experience in sales and marketing. He is currently the founder and CEO of Nova Spark Ventures. As the founder and CEO of Nova Spark Ventures, a healthcare sales and marketing consulting service, he is at the forefront of steering the company's strategic direction and operations. His role encompasses developing commercial strategies, creating go-to market plans, expanding service capabilities to meet the growing demands of startups and small to medium-sized organizations. Okay, you're welcome. Look forward to talking to you. Thank you, Darshan. Same here. You've had quite a storied uh, background in uh, healthcare, uh, sales, and marketing sector. And I'm wondering, if can you share with us some of your journey and some of the key aha moments that have put you on the path to where you are now? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. So I've been very fortunate to be um, uh, surrounded by some amazing mentors and coaches who guided me along the path. And so a couple of key aha moments that I've had was that uh, I actually did not start in healthcare and did not start in sales and marketing. I started out my career with an undergrad in chemical engineering. And I think I took that because I was just intellectually curious. I was always uh, the person who wanted to think about the why behind things, uh, what makes things work. Um, and so uh, while that was fulfilling, it wasn't really what my passion was. So my first kind of aha moment in my career was that I wanted to be somewhere where there's purpose, where I'm doing something that has a clear and positive impact on society. And with that in mind, I went to business school and pursued a career in healthcare on the commercial side. I was also excited by the business side of things. You know, I didn't see myself being a physician per se, but this way I would be a cog in the wheel and helping bring therapies and new solutions and uh, innovation to help save patient lives. And that's what's kept me in this field for 20 years. So that was kind of my first aha moment. The second one was that I started out in marketing and was in marketing for about five years. And at that time, one of my mentors was like, well, you know, the answers are out there. They're not in the corporate headquarters. You need to go out there. And I think that's something that you also, you know, talked about in your, in your book, getting to aha, you know, that the answers are out there. And so um, I took the plunge and usually folks go from uh, sales to marketing. I went from marketing to sales, kind of going the other way and just had this, this really defining experience of walking a mile in the shoe as a pharma rep and then as a, as a leader in sales. Uh, how do you uh, go out there and, you know, once you get your quota, how do you go achieve it? How do you create a plan around it? How do you create a strategy? How do you build connections uh, with your physicians and so forth? And then once in the leadership position, you know, I didn't have the legacy of background that some of my team members had. You know, they'd been in sales for 20 years. So really leaning on their expertise uh, was another aha moment in there that, uh, uh, you know, as a leader, the answers are out there, but they're also not always going to come from you. And that's okay, because that's where uh, you're really helping unleash the potential of the entire team. So those are kind of two or three kind of key moments uh, that have kind of helped me to get to where I am today. So when you were told the answers are out there, did you actually start going out and looking or did that uh, need more? Uh, nudging and prodding to you actually, for you to actually realize it. And, and what point did you realize that I really understand what they're saying, that the answers are out there? What does it mean by that? Yeah. So, you know, the way I really learned is I became a sales rep um, uh, and took that on full time, not just kind of being out in the field and carried the bag for about a year and a half. And during that time, Darshan, it was great for me because um, there's one thing around strategy and the theory of it. But the other was actually seeing how do physicians think uh, about the product? What, how do they think about the patient experience and their journey? Well, how do they make a diagnosis? Once they've made a diagnosis, how do they choose what therapy to use, right? And so all these things, I got to see it firsthand and that just validated that you can't use those one-off experiences to make a broad brush assumption, but you start looking at that to triangulate with actual data that you would have and aligning that experiences you have and starting to kind of see if you form a hypothesis and does uh, 
uh, do the data points and insights kind of congeal towards a, a solution and validate it? Or do you refute uh, your hypothesis? So, you know, those are some of the things that, you know, having that experience early on in my career, uh, I kind of set that as kind of hardwired into how I operate. And then I've been since then using that time to making the time to go out in the field to understand what it's like to listen to the sales team, uh, as you do with the data and try to see how these things kind of intersect. And that's usually where you'll find the answers. It sounds like you incorporated two things. One is just genuine curiosity and the other is Socratic selling, where you actually learn more by asking questions than actually telling someone what to do. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I would say so. And just the Socratic selling, I think that's great. You know, some of the things I've said is that, um, uh, some of the best sales reps I know are introverts, right? And in, in, in most people's mind, you think salesperson, someone who can talk to anyone and go out there. And I'm a personally an extrovert, so I had to really work on this part. It wasn't naturally easy to me. Uh, but what I'd seen through others is ask the right question and then pause and then listen to what they have to say. And, you know, physicians, uh, uh, they know a lot about their disease state, about the patients in the area. So how do you leverage that and create a, like a stage for them to, to talk to you about it and learn from them? Uh, and another part that I really learned through this part, and especially in healthcare, is knowing the language is really important. Understanding how physicians talk about things, knowing the terminology. If you don't know the terminology, uh, then you lose credibility in a hurry. So uh, the more you kind of know the terminology, the science behind it, to ask uh, great questions and then listen and observe and see what they have to say. Uh, I think that helped me build a lot of credibility uh, with the physicians in, in my area at the time. And then it helped uh, me teach other salespeople as I kind of moved on and got into a leadership role on how do you effectively do that. Right. I mean, it sounds like uh, in many ways, uh, what you ended up doing was basically doing what the doctors do, which is taking a case history, right? You actually listen to them, have a conversation. And you actually listen to whether their pain points, what they're going through, and you gain a lot of insights. Uh, so I'm curious, how do you define insights? Oh, fantastic question. It's, uh, I think it's a little bit elusive. I don't know if I have a clear definition on that, but to me, it's, um, you know, at the base, you have information, right? And we have just so much information in the world right now uh, that's coming at you from different areas. Uh, the way I see insight as being different than information, it gives you uh, a deeper understanding of your customer, of your physician, of your patient in a way that others around you don't, right? So your competitors may not have that. It's almost like this intellectual property that you have that allows you to create strategies that address either the pain points or the opportunities that are out there in a much more profound way uh, than anyone else can. Now, have you found that there was a particular insight early on in your career in sales? that really changed your trajectory in terms of your sales performance? Yeah, so I think there's two things that come to mind. Uh, number one was the clinical selling thing that we talked about, right? So you have to have a seat at the table in order to make those decisions, right? And the, the faster you can get to that point of um, building that credibility that you're not just there to drop off samples per se, but you're there to have a conversation, I think that goes uh, a long ways. The second insight that I found was going through my uh, through our data is that I saw that most of the reps were calling on their top uh, prescribers, the so ones who had the most uh, patients or, or volume. And um, I took a different strategy. I looked for those physicians who are actually diagnosing more patients. So I looked at kind of a derivative of who's rapidly growing, who's prescribing more products, who's diagnosing more patients and focusing on those physicians versus the ones who may have a large volume but are static and they're not diagnosing any new patients. So that kind of strategy allowed me to triple my business in 18 months and that got a lot of attention from the home office and led to my promotion into a sales leader role. So you obviously hired a lot of people in sales. I'm curious, did you find a way to glean if someone has these capabilities to have conversations and gain insights and to be able to act upon them? Yeah, I think some of the things I was looking for, um, and I still look for this in any hiring I do, is I look, number one, for hunger. Is someone driven? Do they have that uh, drive to say, I don't know the answer, but I'll figure it out, right? So that's kind of, to me, one of the foundational things that I look for. 
the second thing I look for is can they, uh, do they have the intellectual curiosity to ask the right questions? Uh, do they listen well in, in the interview process? Right. Do they follow up well? Right. And because these are things that then kind of translate into the skills that they're going to have to have uh, to be successful. So those are really the three things that come to mind. It's just someone who's hungry, that's driven, that's motivated. Second, just having some kind of intellectual curiosity to go beyond just the, the standard call and knowing what kind of questions to, to ask. And third, someone who can kind of follow the process of, uh, you know, uh, follow up, listening in the interview process, doing the right follow up, and kind of creating this this chain of of conversation that can lead to to value for for the organization, but also for the position. Yeah, I agree with you. In fact, I even look for people who have those three things. Uh, one of them being hunger, which you can't really teach. Either they have it or they don't, right? And the others are they thinkers and doers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it kind of ties in. Yeah, exactly. And I think one thing you're hitting upon is the, and, and the fourth element I've seen is, are they also philosophical? And what I mean by that is I actually have to look up the, the definition and it's someone who has critical thinking and knows that there's more than one way to solve a problem, right? These are the people that don't really focus on the problem because they're going to come anyways, but they're the ones right. that really focus on the solution. How do you find those gems that are out there when you're looking to hire somebody? Oh, it's a, that's a great question. I think one of the things that I also look for along those lines is uh, positivity. Is do they carry themselves in a way that uh, um, exudes positivity and they have a positive influence on others around them that can help build a culture of uh, uh, how can we do it versus we can't do it. Um, and so some of the things that, that have helped me, it's uh, you know maybe not a, a great answer, but part of it is just a gut feel, right? That as you're talking to someone, Hunger. Can you see it in their eyes? Can you feel it in their tone? Can you feel it in the energy that they're projecting? Because uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, pretty clear at times about who's got that hunger and passion and who doesn't. Uh, I think the other thing would be uh, to rely on others around you. Most of the hiring that I've done, you want you have to have at least three to four people who are looking at the candidate, and then they should know like some of the things that we're looking for are. Uh, someone who's going to uh, be part of a team, someone who's going to speak up, uh, who's going to be intellectually curious, hungry, driven, uh, can get uh, things done and drive results. And so having this consensus, but then having different viewpoints, because I've had it sometimes where I may not have seen what others saw, either positive or negative, and that we all have our blind spots, right? You're not, uh, I don't know, I haven't met anybody who's batting a thousand in hiring great talent, right? You all made some challenges and mistakes along the way. So the more people that are involved, uh, the more comprehensive, the more 360 you get on the on the talent. Well, a lot of it also is, I think, uh, just the per assessing the personality of the person, right? And so have you figured out ways to how to assess one's personality with certain questions or techniques? Yeah, you know, some of the things that I've asked, one question that I love asking is, what do you see as your biggest accomplishment in your professional career? And that's one of those questions that's so wide open um, that uh, I, I just love hearing the answer to that to see where, where would you go? What, what do you take pride in, right? What is it that shines with you? Not what your manager thought or what the, the company thought, but what do you think is your biggest accomplishment? And I think that gives a lot of insights into how the person's wired, what their kind of values are, um, you know, what's, uh, what's their kind of compass of what great looks like. Um, and what they take pride in. So that's one question that I've seen that really helps. And then also having more than one interaction, right? Having a couple of different interactions, good. Uh, if I'm hiring for a, a higher level position, having a lunch or a dinner in a casual environment to really get to know them as a person, right? What's, what's going on in their life? What are they about? What are their passions outside of work? And, and I think that gives a little bit more insight into the individual and, and uh, who they are. So going back to your question that you asked, Obviously, there's no right or wrong answer, but what do you look for that you would say, hey, that's a really good answer versus one that's not so good? Yeah, I think for me, what I, what I like to think about is, was it a stretch assignment? Was it something that had some uh, challenges and trials and tribulations as they're going along, right? That it wasn't a clear path. You might have started out not knowing how this is going to go. Uh, so that's one thing I look for, something that's, uh, you know, uh, aspirational or, or didn't see a clear path to it. Second, how do they pull others into it, right? So any big accomplishment that uh, anyone has, 
uh, usually there's input and guidance from others, right? And so, you know, did they go to someone for help? Was there another partner who helped them through this? And actually, that's a good thing because that's how things get done in the real world, right? Seldom do we see things that are just one dimensional, right? You talked about it in your book that, uh, uh, you know, problems are complex and they're multi dimensional. And for that, you need someone who can uh, bring in the thoughts, the viewpoints from others as well to get a more well rounded and more robust answer. So, those are kind of the couple of things I look for is that is it a stretch assignment? Is it something? Uh, where they pulled in others. And then how excited do they get about it? And how excited do they get as they're talking about it, right? And, you know, in a way, it's almost a softball question because you should love talking about what you think is your biggest accomplishment. But it's funny, there's some, there are some candidates who are just not ready for it and kind of stumble on it and give an answer that's like, well, I'm sure I'm looking at your resume. I'm sure that's not your biggest accomplishment. There's so many other things that you should uh, you should be talking about. So I think it's uh, it's interesting also to see where they go with it and and what do they see as their biggest accomplishment. Yeah, and I, and I know what you're saying. A lot of times they might just go back to something that where they got an accolade or an award, which is obviously nice. But I think you're looking for something that where they actually found themselves to stretch themselves personally and then gained uh, some knowledge or experience that they hadn't anticipated. And it was they had an aha moment, basically. <laughs> right. Yeah. How did you grow out of this? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some aha moments you can share with us that you've had in healthcare in the recent years? Because I think healthcare has changed a lot and continues to change quite a bit. And so I yeah. wonder if there's a couple of aha moments you can share with us that you've, that's really kind of changed the way you think about where you're going to be approaching it differently going forward. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question. So the one thing that comes to mind is uh, um, along with the team, I helped launch the largest launch in Versity history, uh, where I was for about six and a half years. And this is uh, bringing on an updated new product uh, that was in uh, aligned with the FDA guidelines and expectations. So while it sounds easy, any change of a product with the hospital is a challenge. So then end product went to the, to the hospital and it required a lot of changes on their part in the entire process from setting up the product codes to making sure uh, they have ordering process in place to how do you uh, get this going in inventory to distribution within the hospital network. Uh, to billing and reimbursement, right? So kind of along the entire journey. And so as I was talking to uh, some of our team members, what was clear is that if we don't make this as turnkey as possible, hospitals will wait till the last moment. And that means that we will not be successful with this launch. So, you know, you talked about in your book, some of the value in conversations and how do you kind of find insights in conversations. And that's the insight that we got is that, you know, we need to make this turnkey. The hospital IT departments are just swamped. And if we don't make this a priority for them and don't simplify the heck out of it, it's not going to get done until, you know, 1159, right? So we've got to figure out how we get ahead of it so that there are, uh, we avoid crises and we get ahead of uh, and, and set everyone up for success. So we started kind of this campaign of just making sure we're listening to the hospitals, understanding what their process are, because everybody's process is slightly different, uh, and then figuring out how do we create a plan for them on how to get this going in bite-sized uh, process. So setting up the product code, all we're asking is set up the product code. What's your process? How can we help you with that? Here's how other hospitals are doing it, and then going to the next part of the process and so on. And so we kind of made it bite-sized, simplified it, created a template for them, and that helped us in getting ahead and the launch was uh, very successful. We exceeded our revenue and margin goals. We exceeded the FDA um, guideline that they had given us from a timing perspective. We were ahead of that and were fully ready before it. And uh, the hospitals in retrospect were also thankful because uh, nobody likes a, a crisis, right? Uh, that, that, you know, if we didn't plan for this in advance, it would have come along. So I think some of the learnings are that healthcare, like many other areas, is strapped for resources. Um, that decision making is complex and there are multiple stakeholders involved. So the more you can coalesce the stakeholders, understand what their needs are and their drivers are, the faster you can get to the end point. And so um, you have to make it easy for them. You can't rely on your customers or create work for them to create their own committees or you know, bring this up in the right environment. You kind of have to figure out how you can take the bull by the horns uh, and help this uh, move along. I think it's a great example of how this really wouldn't have come about if you didn't have those conversations, right? 
And it was, it's, it's actually a pretty simple thing, but if you think about it, it was a game changer for you. And in terms of the performance that it led to, but I think it's a great example of just sometimes these simple conversations can lead to an insight that, you know, you might've just assumed it was just going to be something that they could do. The IT people can take care of it, whatever, but you decide, Hey, you can play a, a better, deeper role. And as a result, I think you probably got more buy-in and loyalty as a result of that as well. Right. That's right. Yeah. And I, I think it's true. And, and one of the challenges we've had a little bit in the post-COVID world is those hallway conversations were gone, right? Uh, people were working remote and you didn't have that uh, environment. And now most companies are working on getting employees back in the office because a lot of time the, the, the value conversations happen after the meeting when you're walking to your office or a casual stop by that you would have. And that's when you really don't have a set agenda and you kind of, things just kind of naturally, you know, coalesce. Uh, uh, that's where I think the magic happens. So I think it's been great to see now that employees are coming back to the office and those organic conversations uh, uh, where I think a lot of time values created are happening more often than before. Have you figured out a way to do this via Zoom calls as well now? Or that's a bit of a challenge, but it seems like more and more people are doing it anyways, regardless, right? That's right. That's right. I think with Teams, it's a, it's a great way to just ping someone, right? And, uh, you know, um, I think what happened, you know, immediately after COVID, at least in my world, is everybody's calendar was just jam-packed with Zoom. And so you didn't have time to uh, coordinate, to communicate with each other outside of that. Um, and then, you know, my philosophy is leaders think and leaders think. Right. So, so as leaders, we, we should spend a lot of time thinking the, uh, about the business and how do we kind of, what are some of the big problems we need to solve? And you need to thank your team members. That's big coming from an executive, especially, or any leader, even a peer leader to say, okay, how do you think and keep everybody going? But the think and tank time goes away because you're so enamored and working on, on Zoom that you just, your calendar is completely blocked. But I think, you know, I agree. I think it's hard to replace it in person for sure. But I think if you still stick with some of the core things, like genuinely being curious and striving to actually listen as well to the responses, you can still get at those kernels and those insights with those conversations. But I think a lot of it starts with what we talked about earlier is having that genuine sense of curiosity, but then also listening as you're going along in the conversation. And, uh, you know, l let it sometimes... You know, go off on a tangent. You never know, right? Where it could lead to, and what could uh, result to, uh, from that kind of uh, divergence from the core. Yeah, it, it, the tangents. Yeah, and some it, that's that's great because then you kind of see where the uh, conversation blossoms into, and that's how you can sometimes stumble onto things, right? So not having everything fully uh, prescriptive agenda, you know, and. Sometimes we're very ambitious, right? And it's a half hour meeting and we have items that are worth 45 minutes. And so not only do we have, not have time for those tangent conversations that you're talking about, but you don't always have time to cover the things we were planning on as well. So how do you keep a realistic agenda and create the space to have those conversations, which to your point can happen by Zoom as well, because you need the right intellectual curiosity and you need to create the space and the environment for it. If you think about it, in these conversations, what actually happens is as you start talking about it, people actually think about it at a deeper level. And once they think about it at a deeper level, then you start uncovering, hey, you know, this is a problem or, hey, I wish this was better. And those are the things you're hoping to uncover at some point. But it just takes a while for people to get to that deeper level of actually thinking and analyzing and then having that as part of a natural conversation. Right. Yeah, you have to do that. And so... You know, we made some changes when I was at Versity in our, my leadership meeting where we used to have kind of a set agenda and we broke up uh, the agenda into some topics that we called deep dives. And so these are kind of big meaty problems or challenges we have. And we'd have a, a 90 minute block for it. And, you know, it's great. You know, my leadership team, you know, really, really sharp folks uh, um, and very intellectually curious. And just letting them loose on solving the problem where, you know, some of them might be working on it and others may be due to their role uh, separated from it, which is great because they can provide a little bit of an outside in view because they're not, you know, blinded by some of the things that, you know, when you're working on it so long that you, you might not see. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes people get these uh, entrenched thoughts and positions, but they just need a little different perspective to, to change their viewpoint. So I understand you recently went to a CMO summit in Chicago. And you discuss a, a variety of topics on marketing innovation with a bunch of CMOs. And you talked about AI and automation. Tell me a little bit more what you see is happening with AI and automation in your field. 
it's a really an exciting time right now. And some of the things that, that um, you know, are my top observations is that um, the proliferation of data, right? And so when you think about data versus insights, I, I see insights as kind of the, the needle in the haystack, you know, because the, the data or the market research information you have, that's not all insight. Insight is just a few things that you kind of pick up out of that that give you this deeper understanding. Uh, as data proliferation increases, uh, which is happening at an exponential pace, your haystack is getting bigger. So how do you find the needle, right? It, it's becoming harder and harder. And so that's where I think some of these automation tools can help. Um, some of the things that we've been working on uh, uh, when I was at Versity and even prior to that is how do you get data to the decision makers so that it's easy and simple, right? If, there, if you have a most commercial operations team where the decision maker sends a request, they process it, and then it gets back to them a week later and it's like, oh, what about X, Y, and Z? That loop takes too long. So tools like Power BI uh, and Tableau are great because that makes data approachable and easy and digestible for the decision makers so they can start looking through that. So I think those kinds of automation uh, reduces that feedback loop and, and everything becomes instantaneous. And to me, that's, that's very exciting because then you're starting to get things, uh, get things going a little bit faster. Uh, the, the second thing is uh, AI sounds really exciting, but it's also very overwhelming. Where do you start? What projects do you get going, right? And so one of the insights that I've gotten from uh, a healthcare AI company that I'm working with uh, through Nova Sparks currently is think in, in small, quick implementation cycles. So think about what are some projects that you can get going in 90 days, right? And they might not be big and it might not be completely transformational, but starts you in the process of working within the space of AI. And then that increases your organizational knowledge and appetite uh, for AI, and it gets you off the blocks. And then you can build momentum off of that. And so those are kind of some of the things that uh, I've shared at the uh, CMO Summit um, around, you know, how do you create tools to uh, simplify and make data approachable? How do you reduce the cycle from data to decisions? Because that's usually, you know, could be long if you have, you know, decision makers who are not comfortable with the data, how do you make it simple and easy for them? And then uh, AI thinking in kind of these, you know, quick, small bursts of implementation so that you can get going uh, versus thinking about a two-year project because guess what? In two years, AI is going to be completely different than it is right now. So you want to look at something that you can get done in the next 90 days. I think you brought up a couple of interesting points there. One is about data. A lot of times people do, I think, confuse data with insights and it's not, right? I mean, data is just one input towards an insight. And the other is you're starting to use these tools to then visualize the data. And I think ultimately what you're trying to do, I think where the value comes in is not just the numbers, but you're trying to show the relationship of these numbers to the bigger picture. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. And how do you go from just looking at the data to from a causality perspective, like what happened to how do we get to predictive and prescriptive uh, insights from the data, right? And again, for me, uh, triangulation is a big part of it. So data, to your point, is one element. Then you have kind of your field insights that are coming in from your sales team or from the time you spent outside. Uh, and then organizational knowledge, right? There's a lot of value in that as well, that you know, there's a lot of information, insights, and knowledge that's stored uh, in, the, in just the, the brains that you have within the organization. So how do you kind of tap that? And then when, then you have kind of these three things that you kind of try to bring together and see where it makes sense. Because data is always patchy, right? There's, I, I rarely seen uh, things that have, uh, you know, clear causality that A, therefore B, right? It's, it's always muddy, uh, which means that, you know, supplementing with market research, supplementing with insights from customers and conversations that your sales team has had, uh, that all kind of starts bringing everything together. Yeah, I think at some point you actually have to sit down and talk to your sales team as well, right? I mean, they, they can write down the comments, but I just have those conversations to flush out in more detail, I think. Is that something you often do? That's right. Yeah. So we, we do that as well. We've got our, um, you know, uh, various me means and mechanisms that I recommend through the variety of roles that I've had in, in getting the sales insight. So, you know, a lot of times the annual meeting, the plan of action meeting is a two-way conversation. Uh, and you're trying to uh, learn from the sales team on what's going on out there. Uh, what are they seeing? What are their challenges? And how do you create an environment where your marketing team is doing that? Because 
when your marketing team is doing that or kind of leveraging the sales team and their insights, then you're better off uh, and, and you can provide resources that are more impactful in what you're trying to do. Also, there's a feedback loop from sales to product development, and that's a little bit more complex. But if you can have the right type of sales folks who are really clinically curious, they can find and identify insights that plug into kind of your overall engine on what does your product roadmap look like for the next three years? And what should what, what do you want to bring in uh, that would be relevant? And it, at, if anything, it's, at least it's a starting point that then you can, you know, again, validate and triangulate using, using the uh, uh, other sources of, of insights that we talked about. So looking forward, what kind of trends and things are you seeing happening in healthcare? I also had another question for you. What are three common mistakes many organizations do when it comes to healthcare marketing? So I think uh, some common mistakes, I would say, is um, perhaps over-reliance on data. Um, and, and so I would say spend time in uh, understanding the patient journey, because that's where it all starts, right? How are the patients diagnosed? Uh, what are the symptoms? Is a diagnosis uh, a clear one? Is it a diagnosis of exclusion? Uh, is it a long time to diagnosis? Is it very quick, right? In certain disease states that I worked in, like primary immunodeficiency, it could be seven to nine years until diagnosis. So they've gone through a lot, unfortunately, uh, before they're diagnosed. In other cases, like hemophilia, diagnosis is almost in instantaneous or very early uh, post-birth. Um, and so then what are the treatment choices and how are the treatment choices made? And so just really kind of going through from a patient's viewpoint on how uh, uh, the whole process works, I think is super important and investing in that uh, is critical. Um, so I think that's one thing I think I would say as far as from a healthcare standpoint um, that uh, uh, I think companies should look at more relying on them. Second would be just thinking about the patient organizations there. They have a wealth of knowledge and information as well and making sure that uh, you're leveraging that and pulling them in uh, into your plans um, is super important as well. As far as trends, like some of the things that I, I see out in the future is that healthcare continues to be very complex and managing all the stakeholders, whether it's a payer or a prescriber, um, you know, the patient and their needs is, is going to continue to become more and more complex. So looking at how you can get deeper into insights will be important. Uh, pair, the pair environment is always challenging. You know, they're looking to say, okay, show me how this product provides value better than existing options. So having a robust case around that uh, will be important. And then you're just seeing this continued trend around gene and cell-based therapies. Uh, I think that's going to continue, uh, but there's still uh, a lot more that we need to learn because some of the gene therapies that are out there in the market right now, we're not seeing that they're delivering they're not getting the acceptance that uh, um, the companies would have thought, right? Biomarin being a great example of that. So uh, I think there's still a lot that we need to we need to figure out. And then how do we take cost out of the healthcare system overall, right? We have a very expensive healthcare system here in the U.S. And in certain metrics, we're really far behind. Like if you look at uh, maternal mortality, U.S. is terrible. Like it's so sad. That uh, we're we're you know uh, we're middle of the pack. I mean, we're not even in the top thirty or forty countries in the world. So how do we solve those kinds of problems so that you know moms, especially in rural areas or uh, ones of diverse background or certain health uh, or, or socioeconomic conditions, are are given the same opportunity uh, at survival that everybody else is? That's you know one of the most basic needs. Uh, uh, I think we need to address. So. I cover a lot, but there's just there's so much uh, that's going on in healthcare, and it's an exciting time because you have all these just innovative new class therapies that are coming in uh, that hold a lot of promise for the future. Is there a recent aha moment that you've had in the industry as you're working with your new venture, or even a more recent one in the past, an aha moment that really stands out that was more recent? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. So um, right now, I think um, one of the the recent aha moments, I would say. Uh, is uh, working around the the marketing mix, and as you know, these are, I've got a couple of projects that are working around the marketing mix and understanding. Okay, how do we, you know, effectively utilize the marketing spend and resources that we have? A lot of companies are looking for causality, and like we talked about earlier, causality is very hard to prove. I've been focusing on looking at uh, lead indicators that predict 
uh, that you are more likely to have uh, the, the kind of outcome you're looking for. So, you know, as you look at the marketing mix, think about leading indicators uh, that can help you towards the outcomes that you're looking to have. So that's kind of been one of the things that's top of mind for me over the last few weeks. Can you give me an example, a couple of leading indicators you, you think that help you do that? Yeah. So, so for example, in social media, we always look at uh, impressions, right? And that's, uh, you could say, one leading indicator towards, you know, how, what the affinity they have. I have been thinking about looking even earlier than that is engagement, right? How do you create engaging content, which might have more videos, shorter videos, but, you know, the more you can engage and create fun around your brand uh, and have uh, user-generated content that comes in, that's, that's more likely to kind of pull people in from a social media standpoint, because there's just so much out there, right? Again, this is this proliferation of all these brands that are trying to do, and you're vying for eyeballs, you're vying for attention. And, uh, you know, anything that's fun and engaging in that aspect would help in, in uh, pulling people in. So that's kind of one uh, area where kind of having that, uh, those types of leading indicators help you in, in uh, thinking about how you want to do your marketing mix and your allocation. So what do you see in the future for you? What area would you like to emphasize or work on or, or delve into further? A really exciting journey there, Shen, with uh, Nova Spark Ventures and the, the consulting work that I've been doing. To me, what's really exciting is to work on innovation, on bringing new companies and new products to market. Uh, and interestingly, in the healthcare space, a lot of this is happening with small and mid-sized companies, uh, working with them, enabling this, this success, being in a, a strategic advisor to them, and really helping them in accelerating uh, their, their growth is what I personally get excited about, right? And then you feel great that you played some role in bringing a new innovation to market that's going to help save lives in the future. So to me, it's, you know, how do I serve as a catalyst? Uh, for innovation and growth uh, for the clients that I'm working on. That's what, uh, what's most exciting to me. So in the world of uh, healthcare marketing, if there's anyone you could have lunch or dinner with, who would it be and why? Oh, that's great. Uh, great question. I don't know if it would be in the healthcare marketing space, but I might even kind of go a little bit beyond that. And, uh, you know, uh, Steve Jobs uh, is who I would think about. I mean, in every, just, you know, it might be a cliche answer, but like everything that he has done the vision he had back in the 80s and how he was just uncompromising around what he knew and how did he, he, he have that conviction on all the decisions that he had made all the way from the brand, the logo, the design of the logo to having all the products fit on a, on a small table, right? And not, you know, not overwhelming consumers with uh, uh, too many choices, which is also something you talked about in your book. Right. So it's all these things that, uh, you know, uh, in hindsight sounds great, but in the moment, um, how did he have that conviction? Uh, and I, I just love to tap into, into, uh, into that and understand that more. Yeah, I agree. I think he did a, an interesting job of really accomplishing three things. If you can do any one of them, I think you can be successful, but if you can do all three, uh, it's even more likely that you're going to be successful. And those are, he found ways to save people time, money, and made it easier. Right. But then he did a fourth thing, which was actually evoke an emotion. And that led to not only, like I said, if you can, you know, solve, uh, you know, save people time, money, or make it convenient, that's about, let's say, a 3X, right? But if you can evoke an emotion, now we're talking about a whole different factor. Uh, you know, it can be 6, 10, 12X, you never know. And he was a master at doing that. I mean, I remember the, you know, when he did that speech about the iPod and he said, now you can take a thousand songs in your pocket. <laughs> But not only that, but then he showed the flywheel and I was like, oh my God, what is that? Right. <laughs> and just how he tells stories, right. To, to your point about the, the iPod and how he talked about the story around it. It's, uh, it, you know, incredibly engaging. So a great storyteller and, you know, to be able to evoke emotions on top of all the three of the three things you talked about, you know, uh, time, uh, time, money, and making it easy. I think it's been fantastic. Hey, listen, it was great talking to you. I appreciate it. I look forward to reconnecting in the future and finding out about what's also going on in healthcare again uh, down the line. Sounds great, Deshan. Thanks for the opportunity and great talking to you. Thanks a lot. Take care. You too. Getting to AHA was brought to you by iResearch. To find out more about us, head to iResearch.com. And make sure to search for Getting to AHA in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else podcasts are found. 
And don't forget to click follow to ensure you don't miss any future episodes. Thank you for listening.